Hello and welcome to a special episode in which the Blood and Song cast are going to play an original D&D adventure set in the magical world of theatre. This is the first pre-recorded episode of our adventure and I will be your DM today guiding our players and you our audience through the action. This is the first adventure I've ever designed and only the second session of D&D I've ever DM'd so I'd love to hear from you any tips, tricks or feedback you might have to help me learn this side of the table. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the players who playtested this adventure with me and helped me shape it into what you're about to see. So huge thanks go to George Bradley, Chloe Spicer, Rosalind Othanoxenum, Samantha Theobald Rowe and Sam Smith. Without further ado, let's dive into the world of the Smog Theatre. Twas the hour before showtime, and all through the wings, every creature was stirring, preparation in swing. The bustle tonight had a strange kind of tension, and at this point, there's some context to mention, for the theatre in question requires quite a trip. It sits in a special place known as the Strip. The Strip is a demiplane spinning through space where a long row of theatres all jostle for place. At the top of the Strip, they are gilded in gold. At the bottom, they're a little more weathered and old. The demiplane's ruler, a prince of fine standing and one or two tentacles, but really, who's counting, visits theatres on his royal variety tour and if he doesn't like them, or finds them a bore, they're shunted just one place further down on the strip, eventually reaching its precarious lip, and should your establishment tip over the edge, you fall into the void, and there, it is said, you'll never hear an audience applaud you again, and all your atoms are torn quite asunder, but then there is one way to save yourselves all from this fate. Just put on the show, and make sure it's great. So when that prince comes calling, knock his socks off, and up the strip you will travel with a magical puff. So now we're just about ready to kick off our story of a theatre that's almost lost all of its glory. All the way down the strip, clinging on for dear life, one more show will determine the twist of the knife. So they've called in performers, the stage has been set. So my audience, now comes the time to place bets. Will our heroes prevail with a prayer and a song? Only one thing is certain. The show must go on. to the Smog Theatre, a once glorious playhouse which now sits weathered and worn at the bottom of the strip. The strip itself, as you've heard, is a demi-plane that has been shaped purely for entertainment, where audiences travel from all around the multiverse to visit this wide, well-lit street lined with two jostling rows of theatre buildings. Overhead and to every side, the sky is always filled with stars. At the top of the strip, the theatres are gilded and bustling. At the bottom, they're falling apart and struggling to fill the seats. The Strip is ruled over by Prince Crassian, an androgynous archfey who delights in visiting their theatres. On an annual basis, Crassian requires each venue to stage a royal variety performance in order to judge a theatre's worthiness to remain on the Strip. If a theatre puts on an excellent show, Crassian moves them one place further up the Strip, where they enjoy a finer reputation and busier audiences. If it fails to satisfy, they're moved one place further down, and if they move too far, they tumble off the edge of the Strip and into the void below. You enter the Smog Theatre on the night of the Royal Variety Performance as part of the final cast and crew assembled by struggling proprietor Barnabas Smog. The mood is tense. Audience numbers for the last few weeks have been low and the reception has been lukewarm at best. In a last ditch effort to save the theatre, you've all been working on some brand new acts to debut before the Prince this evening but who knows if this will catch the attention of the Strip's entertainment-hungry crowds. As you pull on your costumes and begin your warm-ups, the crowd begins to fill the auditorium above. News of the Prince's visit has brought visitors you haven't seen in months, and the atmosphere is excitable. Peeking out from behind the curtains, you see almost every seat is filled. Even from backstage, you can feel the hush descend on the theatre as all eyes turn to the royal box. The Prince is here in a sharply cut monochromatic outfit with spaces cut for their two elegant tentacles, appendages they weren't sporting last season. 
a keen eye would notice that several audience members appear to have sewn false tentacles in their clothing this evening, clearly hoping to please the royal eye. Backstage, you finish your preparations and make your way to the green room, which is a small shabby space with just enough room for a few cast and crew members to gather and wish each other well amongst a collection of slightly broken chairs and sofas. This is where we begin. So, first things first, I'd like you all to introduce your characters. If we could begin with Sean. Right, so um, in the green room, uh, reading a book, sitting on a chair with his sort of, you know, I, I hesitate to say man spreading, but he's, he's spreading definitely. Um, and he's trying to take up some room and he's trying to make himself um, appear like he wants to be looked at, but he's not paying any attention to anybody. Um, and you recognize him, you may recognize him as um, a BBEG. You may recognize him as um, a bad guy from a previous, let's say campaign, by which I mean military campaign, a push. He is part of, he has been part of a blighted, land and he rules over it and he's but you know that he's been out of the scene for a little while um he is he goes by the name of brian um but he you will also notice that he is reading his own book so he's reading a he's reading the book that he has written uh, and on it um it says something along the lines of and it will shift each time i think depending on on who is who is looking at the book who's 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 approaching him to buy it it will it says something like how to conquer hearts and conquer worlds and it's got something like that on it at the moment um and uh i i guess he's wearing sort of um uh, he, he's wearing it's very sort of formal clothes but with like a sporty twist you know as if like he could at any moment he could sort of i guess it's sort of part like sort of golf it's sort of like golf in the, you know, wherever the last hole is called when you're in the pub. It's, it's, the, it's the golf club attire. Um, and, you know, he's got a sort of scruffy, cool looking. Um, and maybe on his T-shirt, there's uh, like sort of the, the imprint or the outline of what might have been some sort of BBE armour. But he's just got it printed. You know, it's now it's just printed onto a T-shirt. Um, what, else, what else do you need to know about Brian as he sits there? For now, that's amazing. Unless there's anything else that you'd like to let the audience know before the action begins. Um, I feel like uh, Brian is the kind of guy who um, who lets his talking do the talking. So he will. Sure. He will. I think it. It will. Most of it will be revealed ah. on stage. I expect. No worries. In which case, moving on, Christine, would you like to introduce us to your character? Okay. So. Um, uh... My character is his, his head pokes into the room uh, and uh, a bit no nonsense. And he goes, is he in here? Uh, you see a lean, scowling tiefling peering around the room. He's mottled blue with black hair poking out of a roughly knitted black woolen hat. The hat has obviously been adapted by a not very skillful hand to allow two horns to poke through, which run either side of his head. He's got one of those beards that only grow down from his jawline and actually looks like it needs a lot of upkeep to maintain that level of unkemptness. Um, he's got... Ryan. <laughs> I feel so seen. I feel so seen. <laughs> he's got uh, piercings through his nose and his ears. He's wearing big black boots that look like an elephant could stand on them. Um, but uh, as he crosses the room to the kettle, you notice that actually he's quite light of step and you can't really hear them thumping. Uh, his trousers are short, they're quite shapeless, many pockets, and they stop below his knees, showing impossibly polished calves. Uh, and there's lots of seemingly random items hanging from his belt. Uh, on top, he wears an old black tunic, which is emblazoned with the words, no coffee, no worky, in a different shade of faded black embroidery. Um, and in his hand is a chipped but sizable bucket of a mug, shaped like a skull. Um, and uh, yeah, he sort of decides he's just going to wait there and he flops down into a chair, doesn't really talk to anybody. And that's it, waiting for the kettle to boil, basically. Okay. Ryan, 
Would you like to introduce us to your character? Of course. So slumped in one of the chairs, you know, not caring how he's sitting, tummy hanging out, hanging low, is this old elf, 500-year-old elf, you know, he's sort of got one of those suits where the, where the button, like, is bulging at the side there. And he's frantically looking in his, his pockets. Um, and we introduce ourselves to Calcify. Calcify is a, a wizard who's been doing these stage shows for years. A veteran of the strip um, has performed in many different places. You know, now he's currently been drafted in for the theatre. And he's looking around and he's going, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I left it around here somewhere. I am. Um, Dolores, Dolores, where's my cigar, Dolores? And crawling out from behind him, this pink mage hand with curlers in a curlers on uh, around around the the wrist, which comes out crawling. Uh, oh, thank you, Dolores. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is the good stuff. Yeah. Ah oh, yeah. Uh, hey, hey, we got a light. That is unnecessarily big, right? Uh, just, it's just for, just for street beautiful. purposes, this is made out of chocolate as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was a salami. Uh-uh. Uh, <laughs> salami, yeah, it does look salami-like, so doesn't it? <laughs> it is. It's a real salami scale cigar. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I know we have a coke. Okay, Johnny, would you like to introduce your character? Shuffling into the room, only three feet and a half tall, wearing this deep cowled cloak. If you peek under, you might notice this green skin and pointy ears and wispy white hair. And walking in with a broom. Hmm? Excuse me, please. Cleaning. I need to clean. If you don't, I will get this for you. Reaching down, crawling under, picking out some of the crisp packets, just dusting and cleaning, putting some tea bags on the kettle. Hmm. Thank you. I am your gate digger. If you need anything, let me know. Hey, don't, don't touch my it. stuff. Oh, no worries, sir. Your touch will be safe. Just cleaning in the corner. And on that note, Bradley, would you like to introduce your character? I So you see, just like sat on the floor in front of the chair, because the chair is just covered with this big backpack full of like little test tubes and like there's almost a little wisp of smoke coming out from the top of the bag um and he's just sort of sat on the floor pouring liquid from test tubes into different test tubes um and earlier he pointed to just like this collection of ingredients just like strewn about on the floor next to him and he just every now and again just like <laughs> as he's pouring stuff into test tubes and he's uh, he's he's uh, he's quite tall for a gnome He's, he's like a five, four and a half, five foot rock gnome with uh, just a brown eye patch and he's got this quite nice dress robe but the, all of the edges of the sleeves are like singed and acid eaten and uh, yeah he's currently just sort of weighing, just sort of not concentrating on the rest of the room and when the care, obviously when the caretaker claim near he's, uh, he's w keeping a wary eye for him Okay. And Dan, would you like to introduce us to your character? Yeah, while everyone's sitting in there, the door flies open and uh, in strides a six foot nine bronze uh, dragonborn with a wig cap on. This isn't quite what's going on yet. It's a wig cap on and some loose sort of sequined flared trousers and a really tight sort of, I want to say Calvin Klein, give us a sponsorship vest. And uh, followed by an extremely attractive young human and an extremely attractive uh, young tiefling who are both doing like powdering the face and just making sure everything's all right and just following around. One's trying to stick nails on to nails that were already really long, so just trying to get longer. And um, she walks in oh! and she she puts herself very elegantly on the edge of so doesn't sit on a sofa sits on the arm of a sofa next to calcify and she ruffles ruffles his hair oh, oh kelsey oh, good to see you again hello there is that you it i is. haven't seen you in years i know such a pleasure darling such a pleasure 
Are we going to oh, romp this one home? The pleasure's always mine. Ah, well, the prince is here today, I've heard. I'm going to see if I can get a little treat, you know. I mean, you always such a good pet i mean um no i didn't mean that like the way it was it was one of your acts a long time ago i hey, remember i'll see uh... i'll be your pet for enough money so will anyone in this world indeed indeed and then someone comes in and starts just doing her lips and putting the nice blue lipstick on sequined of course as well she sits there in silence that's it lovely okay at this point, I just want to point out to you all that you can all see a playbill stuck on the wall, which informs you all of your running order for the variety show this evening. And the playbill reads as follows. The infamous Mr. Maurice, followed by Potion Master Chim Chimney, followed by the BBEG, followed by Helena Handbasket, Followed by Calcify, the Blade Whisperer and his Swords in the Box trick. Followed by Barnabas Smog's Grand Finale. Mm. At this point, none of you actually know what Barnabas Smog's Grand Finale is. You just know it comes at the end. Okay, at this moment, as you're all waiting in the green room, the door is going to open again and a figure appears. He's a very familiar sight around these parts because this is Barnabas Smog, the theatre's proprietor. He is looking really quite stressed. There are heavy bags under his eyes. His hair looks even greyer than normal, um, but his costume is still pretty splendid. It's seen better days, but it's a red jacket with big black lapels, way too much gold braiding and a big top hat. Uh, and he looks around at you all and sort of seems to pull himself together temporarily and say, Ah, good, lovely, my cast and crew. Uh, good to see you backstage. Yes, yes, yes. Um, right. As the proprietor of this theatre, it is my legal obligation to remind you that uh, there is a first aid kit available at the side of the stage. Uh, now, I know that regulations say that there should be four healing potions, but uh, budgetary restraints mean we're operating with three this evening, so uh, try not to hurt yourselves. And as you all know, tonight's quite an important show, so have a good one and uh, break a leg. Oh, you don't uh, have to worry about <laughs> it, boss. We've got this. And then the jumps up, oh, Barney, darling, don't worry, which kisses him all over the face. Leaving oh. like blue lipstick all over his face, darling. It will be fine, you know. But she like she's like two foot taller than him, almost like. It'd be fine, darling. It'd be fine. It'd be fine. It'd be fine. Yes. No. Absolutely. Now, shush, get out. Go on. Go on. Right. Go on. Right. Quite right. Show must go on and everything. Yep. Good. 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 And she turns around, slams the door, and she does that sort of uh, slide down the door. Oh, thank God, he's gone. He's. Look, we've got to save this theatre. He never will. Um, Kelsey, I see you're doing your box trick again. Mm. Beautiful trick, beautiful trick, darling. Um, so uh, took a little bit. I took a little, um, a little uh, from you, and I, I put that into uh, one of my acts. So maybe we can. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Swords. Uh, what do you do, um, Patch Boy? Are you talking to me? Well, who else has got a patch on here? All right. Well, uh, um, I make potions. They heal people. It'll be grand. You'll see. Oh, wonderful. Um, boy, in the corner there. Horns. Hat. What? Yes, Me? you. You look rather dashing. He is really uncomfortable. Like, hey, really uncomfortable. Like, how are you doing? He is not only noticed, he is really noticed. Hey, so, um, what do you do? Um, uh, Ma Ma Maurice? Uh, uh, is I that what I you do? Don't... I mean... Uh, okay, as Brilliant. what you do, not who you do. I don't, yes, I don't... we can't be saying that anymore. It's true, but we can't be saying it anymore. Oh, I'm you... an old hat, you know. What do I know? I'm old. Now, listen, Kelsey. Do you see who's in the corner? Do you see who's in the corner? Do you? Do you? I mean, you know, in the book. Do you know who it is? I mean, I try not to pay attention to people like that, but you know, 
He's uh something else. It's Brian. Oh, Brian. Yeah. Brian. Oh, He's doing not all right that from guy. Some... Oh my God, Brian thought he was. I went the to world, one of his chats. I went thing. to one of his chats a month ago. Um, there were two people, two people there. Can you believe? I mean, that's a that's a definitely an uplift on the on the half a person that was there that one time. Absolutely. You know, I think and it was, was just the bottom too. half of a ghoul. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, maybe tonight, Brian, might be your night. Um, I'm. I'm sorry. I, I know I've uh, it's been a long time since we've talked, um, but some of us are trying to meditate um, and uh, some of us are just here, not for the theatre, but uh, to, uh, you know, I've got books to sell. And the you know? little tiefling, tiefling girl goes and starts massaging Brian. Look, that's the best way to relax, darling. Yeah. Uh, um, how much do you cost? I think I'll probably get a uh, five hundred of you for the uh, for That's the a... continent of cancer that I run. Um, that I well, I mean, I've given it. It's a shell company now, but I used to run it. Um, but uh, you all know about it anyway. I'm sure you've heard it, of it. Well, this is utterly boring, everyone. Um, where uh, the biscuits? excuse me, miss, you are standing on the dust. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Step back. Thank you. Okay, at this point, you will hear the amplified voice of the stage manager floating around backstage. This is a perfectly normal occurrence in the Smog Theatre. Um, and this time the voice says to you, Good evening and welcome to the Smog Theatre. Members of the Royal Variety Company, this is your beginner's call. Mr Smog, Mr Elhet and Mr Smythe, your call. Have a good show, everyone. I forgot for that. He gets up and goes out the door. For some context, all of you would know that this call means that as the beginners are making their way up, it's going to be about five minutes before the show itself begins on stage. So is there anything else that any of you want to do in the green room during Tracy, this time? Tracy, Chad, probably it's time to start getting ready, I guess. Um, beginners call and all that. <laughs> Sorry. Beginners chicken. You know, keep it lively. <laughs> I think that um, Brian uh, will try and um, take one of the potions from the kit without letting anyone know that he's taking it. Almost like someone might take a shampoo bottle from a from a hotel room. You take shampoo bottles from hotels, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? Yeah, you, you wrap That's it. what they're for. That's what you meant to. You meant to wrap the hotel towel around them so that they don't know yes, that's and then it, put yeah, it and the inside the dressing gown yeah. and yeah. then put that in your suitcase yeah. <laughs> in the duvet uh, Stuart's um, just preparing um, what he needs for the act so I won't I don't want to ruin it <laughs> so I'm just, you, you know what to do <laughs> uh, who's, who's left in the green room or have we all been called out so the beginner's call was just for Barnabas Smog for Varug Elhet and for Maurice Smythe. So they're going to be making their way up. Um, so that's basically Christine's character and two NPCs making their way to the side of the stage. For the rest of you, you will be getting calls at the point where it's your character's turn mm -hmm. to go up to the side of the stage. Helena goes to dressing room one, obviously, and um, goes in there, drinks some champagne. Brian, Brian, do you know why they, and Helena, you might remember this, but Brian, do you know why they say break a leg in the theater? Um, it's because the sides of the theater were called legs. Well, actually, back in my day, they were legs. We just used to get a giant to squat down and they had a squeak and we'd use that as the queen. Don't look up when you're doing your act. It's the best bit of advice I ever got. Um, Brian, he, he, he doesn't even acknowledge it. He's still reading his own book. Page Turner, this one. Caretaker giggles. <laughs> Don't look up. <laughs> yes. You see, this this guy gets it. I feel like we got a good kinship as he just drops ash all over the floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else anyone wants to do before the show launches? Okay, well, as showtime arrives, 
we're going to remain with the backstage action to begin with. At the point where you know the show is due to begin, you hear urgent footsteps come running down the corridor to the green room. The door bursts open again and in flies Dorothy, the wardrobe mistress. She has looked even more stressed than Mr. Smog this week and it looks like someone has absolutely snapped her last nerve. She looks around at you all and says, Right, I need somebody's help urgently. There's something grotesque in the wardrobe department and for once it's not Barnabas Smog. And Helena's head pops out. Sorry, darling, that's probably my excess hair. Um, can I, uh, could I help um, in any way? I, in return, you could probably sew up this um, top. It's, um, it's not quite fitting yet. It's not one of my uh, previous uh, conquests, is it? It's not one of the heroes that I've put in the in the glass coffin. I've I've told them not to bring it to the show, but they might. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. I've seen all sorts come through this theatre, but that, I've never seen that before. And Helena, you're definitely going to want to go and take a look because it's wearing one of your dresses. What? And she's she's gone before it. Like it's just. These huge legs just go. One, oh. One's got one heel on and the other one hasn't. <laughs> and it doesn't slow her in any way, shape or form. Oh, well, we better go ahead and take a look, eh? <laughs> oh, just a well, I always get drafted in extra. I better be getting paid extra for this. Barnabas! Barnaby! Okay. The caretaker is going to follow behind Calcify as he's dropping cigar ash and just be constantly <laughs> sweeping up. Nice. And is Brian following them out? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I think for, uh, Brian, but like he's still, you know, when you have a thumb in the book and you hold it like that and he's reading his book at the same time as he's behind everybody. Okay. And of course, we've currently lost Varug Elhet up to on stage. So sticking with our backstage team at this point is a good time to introduce you all to the geography of the Smog Theatre. So the backstage area is all actually essentially under the stage level. So you've got a corridor to the south where running uh, west to east, you have Barnabas Smog's office, the green room, a series of dressing rooms. Up to the north of the corridor, for running again from west to east, we have the wardrobe department, the trap room and the prop store. So you know that the wardrobe mistress is asking you to go to the room that is basically to your northwest. Helen is already, like, as close to being there as she possibly can be. Perfect. Is everyone just going to go straight inside? Um, can, can Brian will hang out down outside. With a heeled boot, like... Well, Calcify is, is coming in, but grumbling every step of the way. Okay. So, as the door is booted open by Ms. Helena Hand a Basket, it reveals that the wardrobe department is almost exactly as it normally is. There's a lot of chaos around. Um, you know that Dorothy's been very stressed and there's scraps of fabric all over the place and scissors and needles and baskets of things. But there is something you've never seen in this wardrobe department before. And that is quite a small humanoid creature, absolutely covered in barbed spikes all over its body. Its arms are just a little bit too long for its shape. Its face is a little bit scrunched up as it kind of turns to look at you all. And you're struck by the fact that this creature isn't particularly nice to look at, but it's really trying to correct the situation by wearing a glamorous, glittering gown, absolutely covered in sequins, that it's currently trying to pull up over its barbed shoulders and the spikes are starting to poke through the fabric and you don't think the dress is doing particularly well out of this situation. Bitch, <laughs> you better put that dress down. There is no way you look anywhere near as good as me. And if I don't you know. even the slightest kink in that, you'll be paying it off for the rest of your, in like, like genuinely just laying in like expletives everywhere. Okay. She's, uh, she's running in. She's just cat. laughing. It's like, ha, Helena, I didn't know you had a cousin. <laughs> You'll pay for that later, bitch. And then she goes. <laughs> she's just like at it, just trying to go and grab the, okay. go and grab the dress of it. 
if you're going to go and try and sort of like confront the creature at this point, the little spiky creature is going to throw its hands up and say, darling, darling, no, 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 no. I just wanted to borrow a dress for this evening. I've got to look my best if I'm going to sit front of house and watch the show. Who the f- are you? You've got five seconds before I bitch slap you into next dimension. Why, I'm Shaq Rath, of course, darling. And I was once a performer like you, until I took a lighting grid to the head. <laughs> now I work with the Nine Hells, and I'm here on a little work excursion. Well, lovely, but we didn't talk about this dress, and it definitely does not look good on you. Let's just, 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 let's just take it off now, and let's find something better for you. Dorothy here is much better at this kind of thing. This is not your colour. This is not your style, and you do definitely do not have the frontage for that cut, my friend. Off it comes, bitch. Well, the frontage on that comment. Mm. Look, I really want to wear this dress. And if you let me borrow it, I'll tell you a secret. Like, Helena's face just does not move. It's stony face. It's like, go yeah, on. L- I don't know you, about you, but I'm quite make, interested in this secret. You don't make deals with anybody. You just kill them. I don't know what you're... I don't, any, I don't have any respect for anybody that makes a deal with anybody. You just... See, you, you know I'm what almost I mean? certain one of these people, we could probably kill you now and take the secret from your body. Yeah. So you could tell us the secret, and if I feel nice enough, I might have a spare... In fact, Tracy's probably wearing... Tracy, just take that dress off you're wearing now. And we can give that to you. But this that you're wearing here? No. Okay. Make me an intimidation check. Ooh, okay. Can I, can I, can I give the help action by, by, backing up, <laughs> yeah. by backing up the story? Listen, I know can she may I look... You, lately she looked bad now, but trust me, you don't want to get on the backside of that fist. So I think I have a thing. Yeah. When I make a charisma, intimidation or persuasion check, I can do so with advantage. Because but we'll drag- save fl- yeah. I bring myself up to my dragon height mm. and then I stand on the foot that's got the six inch heel on it anyway. So I'm now post seven foot. And as I say, give back the dress, bitch. Mm-hmm. I intimidate. Are there clicks with that? Yes. Let's see. Well, I'm glad I've got advantage. 21. Right. Shakrath looks pretty convinced that they might have bitten off a bit more than they can chew here. They start to gingerly peel the glittery That's dress right. back off their shoulders. Right. They seem to become a little bit conscious that there's a lot of holes in the fabric now. And they say, Fine. I'll tell you one secret for free, but only one more than my job's worth to tell you more. Fine. Well, I'll make sure Tracy's dress, which does look particularly fine in you, Tracy, but it's not looking good on you anymore. Take it off. Um, Cut some holes in the shoulders while you're there, Tracy. Um, You can have this. Dignity, darling. Dignity. Um, Secrets. Everyone, come in. Kelsey. Kelsey, I know you love a good secret, don't you? Do you remember that? Do you remember that one? About well, I, mean, I can't say it because it wouldn't be a secret no more, would I? Oh, that's why I love you. What stays in one demi plane stays in one demi plane. Okay. So the devil is going to beckon you all in to hear the secret. Yeah. And they whisper I've been helping Barnabas Smog plan the grand finale. You're all going to be in it. And the concept is to die for. Now that's oh, a loaded I've, statement. I've, <laughs> I've heard that a few times before, yeah. I mean, it means literally what you think it means. Um, can you just wait for me to get to the end of this chapter? Um, okay, you can carry on if you want, but I'm, I'm not going to listen until I get to the end of this chapter. Okay. At this point in the action, as a certain amount of time has passed, we are going to move our point of view up on stage to find out in the meantime, how have Varugel, Het and Maurice been getting on with their act? Yeah. 
Yeah. So <laughs> we're now moving up to the auditorium of the Smog Theatre. As we've said, this place is looking a little bit worse for wear, but the auditorium does shine better than most of the theatre. It's pretty grand and gilded. There's a balcony that stretches all the way around the edge. There's two very plush boxes. The prince is sat in the one to stage left. Um, and the stage itself is set ready for the opening act of the show. Barnabas Smog gives a flourishing introduction to the performance um, and those in the wings can see that he is sweating profusely, even more than usual. As he introduces the act and clears the way, it's time to take the stage. So, Christine, would you like to describe to us what happens at the beginning of this act? So, right at the beginning, um... Mor the, we, you see the infamous Mr Maurice um, actually you don't see him just yet you hear him introduced his voice is introduced with a big booming deep almost demonic tone uh, and the flames in the hall all flicker every candle flares up and flickers um, to announce ladies and gentlemen and things and beings this is the infamous Mr. Maurice. And then they cut out completely to suddenly have a single spotlight on what looks like a very unassuming man. <laughs> he is wearing a little, what would probably be whatever the demonic version of a tweed suit is. He's quite large. He's got a little bit of a belly on him. But, um, and he is holding, uh, he's, hold, he's, he's just stood there. He pulls out of his pocket a folded up paper bag and out of the other pocket he pulls out a small orange very deliberately sort of nods at the crowd he unfolds the paper bag with a little bit of ceremony he chucks the orange up in the air and catches it in the paper bag nods sort of saying look at that that was impressive wasn't it <laughs> he doesn't say a word then he reaches into the bag pulls out the orange but it's for bigger. What you don't see is that um, it, that Maurice, uh, uh, on the side of the stage, in stage right, uh, is Varug, and he is concentrating quite hard. And he has cast an invisible mage hand, which is assisting during this trick. Um, he also cast Thaumaturgy to create the effects for the beginning. In the meantime, uh, Maurice is stood on stage with this rather larger orange. He looks very delighted with it. Um, and he just pops his paper bag underneath his, his sleeve, pulls out a napkin, tucks that into his sleeve. And then he pauses, looks again at the paper bag, looks again at the orange, thinks, hmm, it's obvious he thinks that maybe he will get more out of this. So he chucks the orange up in the air again and catches it in the paper bag. Oh, that's a bit of a nice <laughs> Reaches back into there. This time, pulls out a ball of string <laughs> he is very disappointed and confused he chucks it back into the bag twice more but each time he pulls out a ball of string he scrunches up the bag and it yelps <laughs> which um he, he yells and drops the bag and crosses to the other side of the stage far away from it um he's now looking at the string he pulls one end of the string out of the ball looks at it quite quite you know trying to inspect it gets a bit bored drops his hand and goes to walk away but the string because of the may chan stays where it is <laughs> what's going on here um the invisible mage hand takes it and dances the string around in a loop um, and then flies off up with it 10 feet into the air um, and so the point where he's holding onto this ball to try and not to drop it, but it's unraveling within his hands. Then he's left with just the other end of the string. The invisible mage hand comes back, takes the other end, and flies off with that. And it has created a tightrope wire across the stage. Okay, so mm -hmm. as the finesse of this beautiful opening depends a lot on whether Varug El Het's magic has come off at exactly the right timings and exactly the right way. Christine, 
Make yes. me an arcana check to find out how well that went in front of the audience. Ah, okay. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got a six. <laughs> okay. So. Oh, what? Carry on. <laughs> the trick does technically happen as described. However, there's just those few moments, you know when you can feel it as a performer, that the timing that you've done time and time again till you swore it was in your muscle memory is just a beat off every time. Maurice is a seasoned performer, so he's doing his best to try and keep things going, pretend that's how it's meant to happen. But there's just those bits where the comic timing then isn't quite there as things aren't just quite what he was expecting with the bag. And as he's fumbling with the string, it's pulling a little bit too much out of his hand and things look just not as polished as they normally are. It's a tough room in here anyway because the audience have come in expecting a very high standard. And as you feel things not quite hitting where they normally do, you know that odd silence that you sometimes get in an auditorium where someone coughs. <laughs> you just hear a little <clears throat> from the balcony. You're not sure whether you've got them yet. However, there is more act to go, so let's see if you can reel them back. So, what happens in the second part of your act? Well, Maurice, uh, he pulls at his napkin, looks at it quite forlornly, uh, shakes his fist at the scrunched up paper bag that's on the floor, and because of Varug's thaumaturgy, it barks at him, and the invisible mage hand nudges it to chase him. He jumps in fright, and clings onto the wire that is um uh, edges across the stage. Uh, Maurice now performs a bit of comedy biz to get up onto the wire. Um, drum rolls begin with various symbol punctuation. Um, Maurice ends up hanging upside down from the wire. He has a firm grip, but the invisible mage hand swings him around. He is clinging on sticking various arms and legs out trying to grab anything to stop him swinging until he ends up with it between his legs which causes him to swing up in pain and he forward rolls on the wire to get up <laughs> on his head <laughs> that's the second part of the act. okay so because in this case um obviously it's partly going to be on maurice's acrobatic skill as to how this is going to work but it's also very much going to be on Varug's knowledge of acrobatics so i'm actually going to ask you to make me quite a special type of check here Oof. i would like you to make me Good. an intelligence check but i think you've got proficiency in acrobatics so you can add your proficiency score to this Okay. So, so intelligence check plus your proficiency bonus because you're so using your knowledge of this acrobatic act to make sure he's where he needs to be. Right. -o. Can I double check with the intelligence check? Let's just roll mm -hmm. D20, add the modifier, and yeah. then add the acrobatic. And you can have well. your proficiency bonus because you know about acrobatics. Right. -o. Thank you very much. Um, yes! 23! Okay. So. As Maurice does the trick on the wire, the audience finally seem to get the point. They just, they're like, okay, this is where we were going with this. This is what we came to see. We want a bit of death defying stuff. I'm not quite sure how they've done it yet. How are they doing it? And instead of the coughing, you're starting to get that little murmur as you know that a few people have started to whisper to each other, Oh, is it, is it wires? Is it magic? I'm not sure. Magic wires? Like, people are getting quite into it now. The reception's got a lot warmer. And you think you see the prince lean forward slightly in the royal box, as though again going, wires? Magic wires? How are they doing this? So yeah, good second part of the act. Thank you. Moving into the final part of the act. What happens? This is uh, a change in tone. Um, Varug uses thaumaturgy um, to make the candles in the hall suddenly flare up again and the band begins to play. Um, Varug casts Silent Image to cause a ring of fire to whirl around his feet horizontally which then tips and reveals the emblem of the prince. He, While he stood on his head 
he sticks his feet out, claps his heels together, and colour spray shoots out on a firework display, momentarily blinding the audience. When the effect ends, Maurice is stood in the middle of the stage as if nothing has happened, and then the invisible mage hand drops an orange from the ceiling. He catches it, looks really pleased with himself, blackout. <laughs> Lovely. So, to gauge Helen is your... clapping, listening on the panel. <laughs> you can just feel it. <laughs> to gauge your final audience moment here as to whether the beat at the end of that act lands. As you're going to be dropping an orange from a mage hand to someone who's just been standing in the middle of a colour spray on a stage, I'm going to need you to make me a perception check to see if you line that up correctly. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. Uh, here we go, here we go. Please. I got a 17. Okay. So. Please, please. It's a difficult drop, this one. Oh. There's a lot going on on the stage. It was difficult. However, as the orange drops, you see that Maurice's fingers stretch out. And for a split second, the orange wobbles just on the edge of his grasp and then goes home and he catches it and the audience goes crazy they liked it they had a good time however Uh this is a good time to introduce a fun little dynamic that often happens with audiences on the strip as i've said it's a tough room they're a really demanding crowd and they know that if the show isn't up to the prince's standards, everybody here might get chucked into a void. So they've got a fun little habit of if they're not entirely feeling it, they might just get up and leave their seat because they just think, ah, do I want to be here when it goes over or do I want to go to a bar? So most people loved it. Fully on board, had a great time, really enjoyed it, exactly what they came here to see. But you do notice that there were just a few people who you never quite hooked back in after that opening moment. It's not too many, but you notice out of the whole swathe of faces you can see in that dim lighting out in the auditorium, you reckon maybe about 10 bodies kind of stand up and start making their way out of the theatre. You think you recognise a few of them as cast members from the very expensive theatres up at the top of the strip. You know their standards are ridiculously high. So you've probably still done really quite a good job that everyone else is still here, but you didn't perfect it. Helen is standing outside the stage door, sees them leaving. He's like, yeah, 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 of course you would. Can't stand quality. Can you? Go back to your posh fucking place at the top of the fucking strip. We'll be coming in, don't you worry. I'll get them all to come in and walk out. Hell on the hell like come on, we, ask, come on. We performed at those places, okay? Cut them some slack. We used to walk out on bottom strip theatres all the time. I know, it just doesn't feel nice when they do it to us. Come on then, bitches, run. That's right, you run. On that note, your act is coming to a close on the stage. So, Varug L. Het. Would you like to make your way back down to the backstage area? And as you come down, just to bring you back into the backstage timeline, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that Brian was still lurking slightly outside of the wardrobe door at this point. So as you descend the stairs and come back into backstage, you would be able to see that Brian is there, lingering outside wardrobe for some reason, his own book still in his hands, Um, and you can see the wardrobe door is ajar and you'd be able to hear some voices floating out of it. And that's what you will come back to. Uh, Where would you like to head? Um, I think um, if there's uh, some kind of urn or something nearby, he would probably head straight to that and grab four teaspoonfuls of coffee (laughs) and (laughs) dump it into a cup, go fill it up. And then he'd just just, like wander up next to... um, next to, to to brian and go all right uh, brian doesn't brian doesn't look up but he goes um um yeah uh you can get a copy of my book uh at the end of the show uh, it might help you with your act um i'll give you mates rates uh if you like but he doesn't even look up from his own book 
Yeah, just, uh, he's just going to go, whatever, and then just go peer through the window in the way that some crew members, when they're backstage, they, they own the whole space. Like, you know, there's there's no... The, the only place they're a bit tentative to go into is dressing rooms, but that's not to avoid the dressing room, that's to avoid the actors. So he'll just wander up and go... And Who just are have you a look, getting just this character from, from Christine? Know, mate. He just walks up. He just walks, <laughs> I know many of them. Uh, he walks up to the... What's up? Uh sort of just leans against the door just seeing what's going on in the wardrobe room okay as our timelines converge at this moment you will hear another call from the stage manager mm -hmm. mr chimney this is your call mr chimney your call thank you and you know that at this point up on the stage barnabas smog will be telling jokes in between the acts and on that note we're going to go to break the audience there will now follow a short interval during which time you can partake of light refreshments and use the facilities we look forward to seeing you for the second half of the show audience this is your two minute call please return to your seats
and welcome back. So just before the break, we opened the show. We had our first successful act and our second act has just been called to the stage. So we're rejoining the backstage action at the point where most of our team have assembled in and around the wardrobe department where a devil has appeared and tried unsuccessfully to wear Helena de Handbasket's dress. The devil's been persuaded out of the dress and has let you in on a little secret about the grand finale. And we will pick up at that point. What's everyone doing in here? Is this where the food is? Oh, um, well done. Sounded great on the um, on the tannoy. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Um, the uh, Tracy's it? disrobed, by the way, um, and given her dress to to the woman. Okay. And she's just standing there. She's just standing there. Like she's got a nice sort of like, but she like she's got some nice. It's not just underwear underneath. It's like one of those sort of leotardy type things going on. Got some, I don't got know some about HP. Clothes. She's wearing what, some HP is she? Clothes. Okay, so Shaprath will accept the new dress and start wiggling themselves into it again, pulling it up over their barbed shoulders. There's a lot of spikes going through fabric. The effect is not particularly aesthetically pleasing, but the dress is roughly on. That was that was at least three months worth of Tracy's wages, so you know that's a good dress. Oh, you look um um yes, darling. You look you look yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. Well, look, um, darling. Um, I know we got off on the wrong foot. Um, but if you've got any more of those secrets, do feel free to come join down here. I might even have a pair of earrings. Uh, a spare pair of shoes, you know, well, maybe what, even uh, let you borrow some of my fake lashes. The secret? used ones. What secret? What's going on? Oh, darling, don't you know? We're all involved in the um, in the finale. Apparently, it's to die for. I've not been paid for that. What finale? What? <laughs> None of us have been paid, darling. You're being paid. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm done wonderful. now. That's it. I'm having this. I've got to wait for my race. Then we go to the pub. What's happening? What? Uh, well, yes, absolutely. Please feel free to fuck off. Okay. Ah, oh, it's just the trials and tribulations of little people. I don't, I don't get it. Are we getting paid? No. What's the finale? At this point, Shakraf will step forward as you have technically started potentially promising them further things if they tell you stuff, and so they will sidle up hearing you asking questions and say, did you want to know more about the finale? I might be persuaded to give over a little information, but I'm going to need something bigger than just dresses and accessories this time, darlings. I'm going to need something a bit more tasty than that. You might have a cigar laying around somewhere if you want one of those. <laughs> Helena gestures just to the whole of Kelsey. Darling, the tastiest man there ever has been. Oh, don't worry. And he is a has-been. I've got something in mind. You see, being a devil, I do dabble in the concept of, uh, you know, corrupting the odd soul. And there is something terribly devious waiting in Barnabas Smog's office if anyone would like to take a look. I mean, I've heard that said before, you know, come into the office, there's something devilish in there, it will help your career. Oh, nothing like that, darling. <laughs> no trouble for those line. people. No, no, no. It's a contract, my dears, if you'd like to come and see it. You see, this theatre's been in financial trouble for some time as you know and smog was trying to find a buyer got to the point of drawing up all the paperwork but then it fell through before he could write the names on of the people who were going to buy it so you see my dear corruptible darlings if someone were to write their name on that piece of paper you've already got smog's signature You'd own the theatre, my dears. 
I mean, who wants to own a theatre? It's full of people like us. Jesus. Can I tempt any of you? Kelsey, um, come on. You could do do well with a the theatre. I mean, I be, I be, I've been around, you know. I'll be able to know what's, what's the good axe or not. Dolores, Dolores, have you got that pen? Hey, excuse me. Excuse me. Yes, oh, my that? darling. What the fuck is that? Jesus. Hey, sorry. I hear you talking. Did, Could you is move, he, please? Is he, You're is he speaking on your to us? <laughs> so is, he, is he speaking to us, well, Kelsey? Well, when did this happen? Actors. Oh, it's fine. You know, the help around these theaters, they're just changing every day. Before they wouldn't even say nothings to us. They'd just be like, yes, ma'am. Yes, Zoya, less everything. Now... <laughs> They kind of want to tell us to move, to, to cl clear up some dust and stuff. Okay, Frantically think... moving around as the cigar waves, trying to catch things. <coughs> Brian thinks it's the help. He goes, uh, yeah, I'll take uh, another wet macchiato. Um, double cream, thank you. Well, um, I'm sorry, mate. He's in a union, so that's not his job. Um, <coughs> I've burnt a lot of unions to the ground. Guilds, too. Um, yeah, well, yeah, well, you're in a union house now. So I wouldn't. Well, maybe I'll put my name on the signature to this place and then burn it to the ground. Then at least it's hey, legal. Brian, great idea. Go sign the contract. You and Kelsey could own it together. Right. Uh, Can one of your shell corporations own this thing, right? I've owned a few theatres in my time, yeah. Um, it's mostly just to lure all the good guys together in one place, feel like they're putting on something for the king. Um, and then you lock the doors and you uh, meteor strike from orbit down and murder everybody at once. I'm, I'm on board with something like that. I mean, I don't like to do the same trick twice, but it worked. Oh, that's what so... I've got my entire career off of. Yes, you okay. have bombed a few times, haven't you? Guys? <laughs> <laughs> like, woo -woo -woo. <laughs> bombed, <laughs> fireball, meteor strike. Hey, what's the difference? It's all coming out of thin air. As the caretaker had obviously been trying to kind of sidle up, I think, just in that moment and get Shackreth's attention, the devil is going to pick up on the way that your fellow cast and crew members seem to be treating you and beckon you over with a long, clawed finger. Were you tempted as well, darling? Would you like to own a piece? Mm -hmm. They can't tell you what to do all the time if you own the theatre. Temptation. Belongings. These things lead to bad places. Oh, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. I thought you were going to do it. Okay. I lead to the void. However, I could be tempted to actually get this place clean if you could move out. All in my way, please. Okay, so the devil's going to give up on the caretaker, but happily keep their sights on Calcify and Brian, who appear to be being swayed towards this. Uh, they're going to turn, so obviously, unfortunately, they've, they've already lost Chim Chimney to the stage, but they are going to turn to check with Helena and with Varug and just say, and you, darlings, am I going to get a little squiggle from yourselves? Well, um, I don't know. Um, do you get a lot of money in it? <laughs> well, I mean... It's the theatre, darling. I mean, money, technically it comes in, it definitely also flows out. Who can say? There's that, um, there's that one, one guy with the webbed, webbed hands and feet. He's doing really well. And the one that wears those coats, those Macintoshes, those two, they're like owning oh. the strip. In fact, they're giving no space for anyone, anyone else. Just these two old, ugly men just, Owning, it, ruining it for us, in fact, I would say. Um, so maybe you could do with owning it. Maybe there's time for a new new, um, new regime around here. Um, well, eh, all right. Okay. Shakrath is going to be looking really quite pleased at this point that they seem to have really quite a lot of people on board for this particular nefarious plan. Uh, so they will begin to sweep out of the wardrobe department, borrowed dress trailing behind them, beginning to really tatter now around the shoulders where the barbs are coming through. And they will walk 
to Barnabas Smog's office, which is in the southwest corner there. Who'd like to go in? Come on, Brian. You said you don't do any negotiation. You might as well just sign the contract no matter what's on it. That's in your book, right? Um, yeah, you don't, um, y well, you don't sign anything and if you've read it. Um, but the thing is, uh, well, you know, you've got to make good you... deals. And this seems like a good deal, doesn't it? I mean, like, we get a theatre for literally nothing. Um, we just got to sign. That's okay. I do like a good deal. Um, I saw a painting once. Um, I painted a painting, actually, um, and it was called uh, The Art of the Deal um, because it was a piece of art. Um, yep. And on it, there was a picture of me signing something and I got something else basically just for doing that. So I feel like maybe, but, you know, I don't like doing the same thing twice. So maybe I won't, maybe I'll, I, you know what, I'll, I'll peek my head in the door of the office. Maybe there's something interesting in there, but I'm not signing anything um, until I know all of the, uh, all the ins and outs and who's involved with the deal with me, you know, can't have two uh eyes wreathed uh in flame and lidless around you know what i mean like I've, I've got to make sure i'm on top i'm not signing anything unless you know i'm in charge well it's not really how it worked would it though because there's like six names on it there's not one above all the rest it's all together in it i don't know i could put you my name above everybody else's it. that's how it works isn't it in contracts in this world I mean, to be fair, his name would appear at the top because his name begins first alphabetically. It's not a playbill, though, is it? It's not like headlining act, is it? It's just like everyone all in it together. No, that's not right. That's not right. I'm not signing up to that if you're doing that. I want to read it. I've been a union debt before. I don't mind having a look at the ins and outs of the of the bits and pieces, but no. Well, you, I tell you what, I've still, I've still got a couple of chapters left anyway. Why don't you read it, let us know the details, and then we'll all decide if we want to get involved. Oh, that's how it is, is it? Just because I'm wearing black, I do the bloody hard work with all the paperwork. You're gone. I, do you know what? I'm, I, 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 I don't mean to offend you. I don't even know if you can read. Um, can no somebody idea. who can read um, please just read this contract for us, please? Mm. Who would like to take a look at the contract. As promised, it's going to be inside Barnabas Smog's office. It appears to be a pile of legal paperwork uh, lying on his desk. His office is otherwise pretty chaotic. There's a lot of other stuff everywhere, but this contract does seem fairly obviously the last thing he was working on. It's smack bang in the middle of the desk. I think two people should read this. I don't think it should just be one person. Just saying. Dolores! Dolores, <laughs> where are my glasses? Dolores! <laughs> oh, there they are. Thank you. Thank you, Toots. Yeah, you look good for the show. It's not getting ready. Okay, Brian's so... just outside the office with his arms folded and his book in his hand, and he's just reading. He's just, no, but he's listening. he's listening. Okay, so Calcify is taking a look. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Varug will have a look as well. And Varug's taking a look. Corbis, the caretaker, do you still want to have a look at the contract, even if you're not that tempted to sign? I will come in. I will watch. Okay, no worries. And Helena, taking a look at the paperwork? No, people are going to do that for me. Um, probably uh, Chad. Chad can have a read. He can't really read. Um, but he'll pretend he's read it and nod beautifully with that jawline. Wonderful. So... Before we find out what the paperwork may or may not contain, we're going to move the point of view back to the stage and find out how Chin Chimney's been getting on. So, back in the auditorium. The atmosphere's pretty good, to be honest. Um, the last act kind of ended on the right note, the audience are feeling it. Barnabas Smog's jokes in between weren't great, but they never are, and everyone's just feeling pretty pumped and ready for whatever the next act's going to be. So as Barnabas Smog leaves the stage, it's empty and ready for Chim Chimney to begin. How does your act start? Off stage, I'm gonna cast Disguise Self on myself. And I'm gonna look roughly the same, but my screen's gonna have, my skin's gonna have this like greenish pallor and it's like snot and tears coming down my face. 
and I'm going to walk really slowly onto the, the stage and I'm going to pull out some coloured water um, but the audience doesn't know that and drink it and at the same time dispel my disguised self and at that moment there's um, I've got some stones that are infused at the back of the stage and one of them's just going to pop up the word wow as I go welcome to my show okay as the opening of your act depends on you deceiving our lovely mm. audience into believing that you've drunk an actual miracle cure as opposed to coloured water, I'm going to need you to make me a deception check. Of course. That is a seven. <laughs> oh, <classic>. oh dear. <laughs> so, as the act begins, the audience were definitely feeling ready for a good time. But unfortunately relatively near to the front of the stalls there's some alchemists in Ooh. and they're having a look at the water and they're having a look at the symptoms of a person coming on stage and they watch the effects and they're thinking that doesn't track the problem is these alchemists have a real personality flaw which is that they don't have great indoor voices so when one of them starts whispering to his neighbor that wasn't a real potion, that was just water. Other people around did start to hear it. So there's just a few too many people in the crowd who are aware that they were deceived. You've got some of them, you know, up in the balcony and stuff, they weren't close enough to hear, they don't know. But quite a few in the stalls getting a little bit rancorous. So. What happens in the second part of your act? Right, well, for my next part of the act, I need someone from the audience. Anyone from the audience, preferably somebody with an illness that I can cure. I've got my great, I've got a great potion. Uh, the one I just drank is an example of that potion. And I can cure anything, anything. Okay, well, as you've called out for some audience participation, this is where the lovely technical crew from the Smog Theatre will step in to help you out. The follow spot operator is used to helping you select people from the crowd. So a spotlight will start whipping round, having a look for anybody who's got a sniffle. And sure enough, the light will land on a seat whose participant is almost too small for you to see. It's a halfling child with a very <laughs> runny nose and slightly red looking eyes who gives a big <sniffs> as he delightedly realizes that the lights landed on him it's his moment oh fantastic yes you child come on come on up on stage i'll cure your illness that'll be great and, and at the back awesome pops up <laughs> okay so yeah the halfling kid will run up to the stage for you uh arrive proudly looking up at you he is tiny like really really small um but i mean he's got one of those big kid personalities that means he <laughs> automatically stands facing out at the audience because he knows that's what you're supposed to do <laughs> oh well right i'm gonna have to get my portions a bit different here get, bear with me one sec i quickly pull out a test tube and i pour a bit of the potion into the test tube and give it to the child and it looks he has to grab it with both hands i assume <laughs> absolutely so he's going to take it from you with both hands give it an experimental sniff and then as many kids do just kind of look to you to be like do i do i oh yeah yeah, yeah. i've put in a little bit of cinnamon it'll taste really nice just give it a drink and your, your sniffle will be gone it'll be great okay okay i'm gonna drink it now and he next the potion and he starts transforming into a very very small middling 50s old balding man with an overweight belly and i'm like oh um all right well uh that's that might be the, the wrong portion um uh bear with me uh, 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 just one second uh, i pull out another potion i just pour it on top of him okay at this point, because the audience have watched you take a small child from the crowd, 
give them a mysterious potion. <laughs> the child's turned into a very small, middle-aged, balding man. You're going to need to make a performance check to see if they're buying that this isn't okay. just a total disaster. <laughs> it is a total disaster. I've rolled a seven again. Excellent. <laughs> you can take Brad out of the campaign, but you can't take Brad out of the dice. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> The audience are watching the events unfold. Sometimes, when disasters are happening on stage, the audience get really on board and they're like, oh, it's just part of the act, I'm really enjoying this, I'm enjoying the storyline. This time, there's quite a lot of people who are under no illusion that this isn't entirely what you wanted to happen. (laughs) They're not entirely sure what they're watching. And they're all kind of in that slightly, you know, we've all had a drink before the show, We're ready to see where you're going with this, but we hope you're going somewhere with this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of expectant faces going like, what, what are you going to do with this tiny middle-aged balding man? And, um, and as the third part of your act begins, the small child is going to look down at their now wrinkled hands, feel the bald spot on their head, pat the beer belly and the bottom lip is going to start to wobble. And they're looking quite upset. Uh, 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 no, don't worry, don't worry. Um, calm down, calm down. Uh, right, um, this potion. No, oh, oh, that's just made your hair wet. That was water again. Uh, Chris. Um, oh, this one, this one. I pull out a different potion. Then it's just like a blight for us and green, and I pour it over the top, and it has the effects of in an enlarge, reduce spell, and makes him ten feet tall. <laughs> Okay. So I, I use my enlarge reduce to do that. Very nice. So, fundamentally, this audience member is still a small child. They just happen to have been materially turned into an old man and then suddenly made 10 feet tall. Now, this kid earlier, when wondering, do I drink the potion or not, looked to you. It's sort of, you know, he's letting you lead how he feels and responds (laughs) to this extremely weird situation. So... With the bottom lip still quivering, he's going to look over to you and you're going to need to make me a persuasion check if your body language is going to convince him that everything is okay with him looking down at you from ten feet high. Uh, That is a five. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Brad. (laughs) Oh, that's insane. That I honestly insane. promise you all of these checks were achievable DCs, but unfortunately the dice have not been on not your side. Brad, they're not. not. I've got to be honest, when I go to the theatre, this is the show I want to watch. <laughs> the one that just goes wrong. Fantastic. Okay, so a ten foot tall, middle aged, balding man is now standing in the middle of the stage, bottom lip quivering snopped, still running down his face. She didn't cure the sniffle. Um, and he goes, I want my mummy. Oh, this is not going well. Um, uh, well, well, thank you for the show, everyone. Um, I hope you have an enjoyable evening. Um, oh, quick shout out to Benny Harvey, RIP. Uh, gone but not forgotten, big man. Right, I, 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 I'll see you later. And I just run off stage. Fair enough. So... At this point, the audience are definitely in a pretty riotous mood. Uh, The basically, so this now 10 foot uh, halfling child in this body uh, is collected from the stage by his mother, who looks furious as she tries to lead him out to the bar. Bearing in mind, she's also having to now duck his head through the doors at the rear of the theater to get him out because he's 10 foot high. The whole thing's pretty chaotic. And um, basically within the auditorium, there are now quite a few people who are starting to get up and wander away from their seats. You think more than 20 this time around and about are moving. Quite a lot of them from round near the halfling. You think maybe they were a family friends group that had come together and need to go check on them in the bar. But overall, the mood out there, it's getting a bit... It's getting a bit loud. People are chatting. There's a bit of an odd atmosphere. And the prince is sort of leaning back in the balcony, really thinking 
about what they've just seen. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the child, all that is just pure... It just disappears in 10 minutes and he's still the same sick child. <laughs> Perfect. So yes, out in the bar in 10 minutes time. Sure enough, poof, halfling child returns. Uh, but at that point, a lot of those people who are then out there will actually leave the smog theatre. <coughs> so. Helen is disturbingly quiet at stage jaw for that one. Like, <laughs> just letting yeah, him go. Just walk back. Well, that went uh, okay. Uh, it could have been better. Um, I, 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 I'm i sure the next person will be able to pick it straight back up and the crowd will be uh, alright darling there's there's something that you might want to be more interested in obviously a life on stage isn't for you um, why well don't you it's uh, my life depends with... on it uh, I feel um, well... yeah why don't you have a little um, chat with Brian and Kelsey they've got something don't talk to don't talk to Baruch he's um Literally untalkative. Um, so I don't know. I've been getting this. that from you. I, I think I might get on with Veruga a bit more than you. Uh, well, you know, darling, you'll you'll come round eventually. And if you don't, I'll make you come round. And yeah, she that's... smiles a little bit too big. Lightning crackles in between her teeth. Would you like a portion? <laughs> um, after I still uh, heard what you did up on stage, I'm quite all right. Thank you very much. Yeah, I thought as much. Yeah, I've um, I've seen worse. Okay, at this point, as Chim Chimney rejoins you all backstage, another call is going to come out over the tannoy. Now, you can all hear at this point that Barnabas Smog has launched into what you all know as the emergency comedy routine. This is what he does up on stage when he thinks something's a little bit shaky to try and get everybody back in the mood for the next act. However, rather unexpectedly while he's doing this, the call comes out Caretaking staff to the balcony, caretaking staff to the balcony. I sense a disturbance in the theatre. <laughs> and I'll start slowly waddling. Lovely. So, the caretaker is going to leave you all at this point. For the moment, we're going to stay with the backstage action while Barnabas is up telling his jokes and the caretaker's been called away. So... You are all now, you've just been led to Barnabas Smog's office, the contracts are on the desk, and some of you are taking a look. So, for those of you who want to read the contents of the contracts, can you please make me an investigation check to see what you find on the paperwork? In the meantime, um, Chim's going to walk in and say, and ask about the situation, and he's going to be very interested. Very, very in. interested. Uh, Varug got a 24. So did, uh, so did Calcify. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and so seeing that Chim Chimney has also come over and is very interested in the paperwork, uh, Shakrath will beckon you to come closer, take a look uh, and fill you in on the events of the previous conversation. So if you would like to also be taking a look with a view to signing, you are very welcome to do so. Yeah, that's an 11. Okay, so in that case, it is just Calcify and Varug who find a very important looking paragraph buried right down in the small print. But the reason why it looks important is it mentions the fact that should you sign this contract and own the Smog Theatre, which you can purchase from Barnabas Smog for the token sum of just one copper piece, because you can tell he's basically just trying to get it off his hands. The issue is, Shakref is the broker of this contract, and one of the terms that you will be agreeing to is your immortal soul being handed over to the Nine Hells for all eternity. So it's one copper piece and your soul. I mean, everything looks fine here, so I, I, I might sign this. Well done, well, well done, well done. Well, hold, uh, hold, hold on a minute there, Jim. There's a thing in here that says your, your soul forever's got to be in the nine hells, right? Now, here's what I'm thinking. It means I get to live my life as a performer in the nine hells. Imagine trying to bring comedy to that kind of place, you know, or, or magic or something like you know people are like oh i'm getting tortured over here oh there's a poker going where it shouldn't be 
And then you come along and you throw a potion on them and then they start laughing. Well, I don't know. After that last performance that I just did, I think I could probably be sent to the Nine Hills anyway. So, like, it, uh, this, this is a win-win for me. I get to own a theatre and I get sent to the Nine Hills already. Well, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's like... I, I, once, I once heard a guy say, in for a penny, two for a pound. A very, very good-looking muscular guy. Um, he seems like Cross he knows what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, look, I ain't got... I've been around in this site for a long time. You know, I've been in and around all these theaters and everything. I'm, I'm going to put my, uh, my, my John Hancock on this thing, you know? I'm sorry, what? That doesn't make sense. Oh, you it's, put, a, it's, a phrase I, it's a phrase I heard in this, in this really weird place this one time. Right, they okay. think they own the shop. Right, well, I'm, I'm going to put my signature on this as well. I, I, I feel like this actually saves me a lot of problems. Well, I guess the nine hours are warm. I'm always bloody cold up here. All right, then. <laughs> okay, so just to confirm, who's going to sign this piece of paper? Cal Calcify would put a signature no, down. Germany is going to put his on now. Mm -hmm. That was Darlings, my agent hasn't even looked at it. I'm not signing. <laughs> and Brian, have you been tempted? Um, you know, I've uh, I've been to ten hells once. Uh, the nine seems like a step down. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know what? It's uh, you make a go of it. I mean, if if uh, this theatre needs to live on based on the performances that's been given so far i say that your souls are in for a rough ride um helena um i wonder if we could chat later um have you ever thought of being um uh and and we can talk more over a coffee but have you ever thought about being a right hand and i've seen i think i can see what you can do with your right hand but I'm thinking like a, a lieutenant type role because it's quite a glamorous thing, and I'm always I looking what for you're those. Doing here, Brian, but um, it's top billing or nothing for this queen. Oh, I mean, listen, um, this is the thing about um, being the right hand is that you mm. are top billing. Like nobody looks at the um, the big lightning bolt in the sky. I mean, it might be the the real BBE, but everybody's looking at the person on the battlefield with the magical charm or the bracelet or the special weapon. They're the like ones him. that people are that fierce. That's the name of your album, the real BBE. I like it. Well, it, you say that, but uh, I have released several albums. Um, you can find them on vinyl because that is the only way to listen to. Uh, uh, yes, to, uh, no to one listens to that it. anymore except for the old people. Kelsey, do you still have vinyl? Um, you like, and you have to turn bacon, the crank you? at yeah, a that's certain right. speed. Yeah, you have to do old yeah. old people things. Oh, I quite okay. like listening to vinyl. That's like you have to concentrate on I, the music. Then who am I surrounded by? Dear God, Tracy, get me some get me some champagne now. Well, look, if you change your mind, it's a flamboyant lifestyle. Um, there's good hours, by which I mean you can torture all hours. Um, you, you, you have a lot of free reign, basically, about how you want to rule. And you get to rule the kingdoms, you know, if you succeed. I'm going to say when, because I've been quite good to my lieutenants. And most of them have, uh, have What's been the able shelf to... What's life on them? Uh, oh, you know, I mean, as, as, as many as uh, there are unquashable heroes in the realm. So really, that's up to you. You know, right. if you let your heroes roam free and you want to have a balance, then you're going to have a few uprisings. But yeah, that's, surely you um, put them down before they become heroes, yeah? Do you know, I was just saying, wasn't I, Kelsey? I was just saying, I mean, I mean, I wasn't, but I was just saying, like, that's what I'm looking for, Helena. That, that sort of, uh, it, it's initiative, really, because you're mm. sort of working as a free agent, you know? I mean, I take a, a percentage of the, of the souls, of course, but, I mean, that's just... Um, I'll get your agent to look at it, you know? Your agent will look at the contract, it'll be fine. Oh, I'll, I'll put you in contact with my agent, yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, I just, I know that um, when you guys age out of this kind of gig, uh, you might want somewhere to I'm go. Sorry, what did and you there's, just say? There's age no, out of this. <laughs> there's no age limit on being a lieutenant. You can come back a thousand years later. Do you know Having what I mean? You go into a prison. We gone at this point, right? You go, and you stay just, there in a prison for a thousand years. You come back out, away. it's all good. Age out my ass. <laughs> Oh, anyway, I'll talk to your agent. Yeah, um, and so Brian doesn't um, doesn't sign the contract. No worries. Well, in that case, for the three of you who would like to sign, you can successfully sign this paperwork. 
at the point where you do and the final signature has been done Shakrath looks delighted. This is a good day to be a devil in the theatre. And even though you gave them their second option of dress, they look a million bucks as they triumphantly hold the contract up and go, darlings, I just knew I was going to find some corruptible souls in the theatre. Congratulations on your purchase. I hope you love it. Now then. I did say I might let you in on a little more stuff. And as the new proprietors of the theatre, you ought to know that your purchase has come with a little bonus. You see, the previous proprietor did engage us, after all, to help with his finale. So maybe I should show you what it was that he bought. Why don't you make your way into the prop? Store. I mean, it's uh, it's our finale now, isn't it? I mean, it's still his it's still his act. It's still his act, Jim. Don't don't be that guy that tries to steal other people's acts. Uh, oh, don't well, worry. Right. You're okay. very much going to be involved. Well, yeah, we like, we own it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it looks, right? I'm not I'm, I'm not confusing it. Is that? Are you guys going to change the name of the theater? Have you decided? Well, yeah, it's got that old Smog's name on it. Like, I'm going to think of something like I think something else. Like Chim's something. I don't know. I mean, Chim, Chim, Jiminy and Smog are already too close together. We need to get rid of those <laughs> all. We don't want to associate with that. You know? You got a problem with my name there, Calcify? Of course I do. But you know what? That's just me. <laughs> Brilliant. I don't give a shit. I just want a bit of control with the budget about the special effects, and I'm not doing the box. Oh, I haven't got head for numbers. You can you, you can, can do have all that stuff. One pyro a day. That's the budget we've got for one pyro a day. <laughs> um, but we want to fire it three times. Is that possible? I don't know. Well, I just want to run the bar outside. If you'd let me run the um, bar outside, you can run the rest of it. Calcify, I don't mean to be, I don't mean, I mean, this has nothing to do with me, but isn't your right. name kind of also close to sort of Chim, Chimney and Smog? I mean, you're a BB, you leave all of the, well, an ex-BBB, you leave all of that magic stuff to the people who knows what they're doing, right? So let me know what I'm doing. Yeah, okay, yeah, no, fair point. Okay, at this point, we are going to move the action to the balcony where the caretaker was called to deal with something during Barnabas Smog's emergency comedy routine. So, while this has all been taking place downstairs in the office, you can make your way through the theatre's corridors, heading for the balcony. You know you can get there basically sort of directly from backstage, you can weave around, um, and as you come out, you'll see that although it's quite dim, obviously out in the auditorium, you've still got a fairly good view of everyone who's sitting there, everything that's going on. As an experienced caretaker, it doesn't take you very long to work out why you've been called into the balcony. There's a school trip who are sitting there enjoying the show. There's a variety of kids, but they're all sort of similar age, you reckon, that basically it would be the equivalent of our kind of human primary school. But obviously they're slightly different ages for the different races and they're all sat there in their chairs with not quite enough teacher supervision per pupil and you think it's probably been getting a little bit rowdy for a while but most importantly you notice that one of these children is holding a bag of what is considered to be a caretaker on the strips greatest nemesis it's confectionery from a specific brand see elsewhere in the multiverse Someone called Tilly Tonka has been inventing sweets. And one of the things they've come up with is called a sticky sugar bomb. The idea is the kid puts mm. it in their mouth, it fizzes for a number of seconds, and then explodes to coat your mouth in sweetness. The problem is the kids have worked out that if you purse your lips at exactly the right time, you can shoot magical sugar into your surroundings with explosive force. It's a bag of sticky sugar bombs in the hands of children with not enough supervision. Not gonna be lie, that sweet sounds pretty bang. Act, won't it? So yeah, I need, me, I need me some sugar bombs. <laughs> no, these sound great. Let's invent, let's invent. So... To make matters worse, they're all of the supervising teachers are all music teachers. 
If they were, Ooh, listeners, that's the a kids would be silent <laughs> and well behaved. All the music teachers would be outside having a cigarette, like having yeah, a day absolutely off. Be outside We're not smoking. allowed to do that anymore, Dan. Not since like two thousand seven. <laughs> that doesn't stop people. You're just not allowed to do it. Like just cardboard cutouts with all the teachers I, in school between. Trips, school trips, uh, holidays for the teachers. Like sometimes they, you know, they always, don't always. Clearly, you've but... had bad schools in your theatre. My school, was yes, Marvel. <laughs> yes, we have. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately for Corvus, the caretaker, these are not mm. particularly vigilant teachers. So you can now see in the balcony this bag is being passed between small hands. What would you like to do? I will wait. For acting too soon is not wise. I will wait until the moment their lips are pursed. Okay. And then I will cast Gust to blow it all over them. It. Gentle all choking right. the children. Nice, nice. So, in which case, the bag is passed along the row. You see small grubby hands grabbing sweets, sticking them in their mouths, and sure enough, you're going to hear that telltale fizz that tells you they're getting ready to go off. Luckily for you, the kids think it's particularly hilarious if they all go at the same time. So you're pretty sure the explosion's going to be roughly simultaneous down the row. So you can cast Gust. Um, now, because you're going to be trying to obviously very specifically redirect magical sugar using this spell, I'm going to need you to make me an arcana check to work out if this is actually going to have that very specific effect. It is a 16. Okay. So, the fizzing completes. The lips are pursed. And as the sugar shoots out, it whips back into some very surprised small faces. You now have a row of magically sticky children who are mildly horrified that their prank didn't come off. You can see them touching each other's faces, poking it round, and the little grubby hands are inevitably now reaching to wipe on the back of the audience's head and clothes in front of them. What would you like to do? Hmm. Plus snot. There's I would snot. like... Ooh, ooh, ooh. Final. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, it's tempting. Instead, <laughs> instead, I would like to use Star Map. So, as part of my skill set, I have learned from traveling, uh, a map will just appear in front of them of stars glitzing and moving to dazzle and amaze them to hopefully small children are easily distracted to distract them long enough okay so you're specifically trying to use so is it the movement of the stars as well that you're trying to use to distract them is that like to a dazzle yeah. them and distract them so they all look up and go whoa mm. hopefully to give me enough time to then um use my mage hand to go and clean off my mage hand is invisible by the way to just okay. go and clean all their little hands with the baby wipes that i pull from my inside nice if you're going to be cleaning them up while simultaneously trying to distract them these are kids you're going to still need to be reasonably quick to stop them just getting wise and wiping anyway so can you make me It's your mage hand as opposed to your hand. So we're going to do an arcana check, but with your dexterity. Mm. So you Even can use better. your arcana proficiency and your dexterity because it's you controlling a hand to go down, wiping, trying to get this done before the kids realise what you're doing and just wipe their hands anyway. Oh, much better. Mm. So that is a 19. Okay. You just manage to whip it down the row while they're distracted enough that all the little hands are paused just there for you as you're baby wiping off all the sticky sweetness so that when the occasional hand does 
brush a jacket in front of them. Nothing comes off. No harm done. Audience member just thinks it was a slightly disruptive kid touching them. No one's been, no one's been swiped with sugar. However, the kids are now aware, obviously, that, that you've done something. Um, you know, they've just seen some stars appear. A mage hand's just come down and wiped them all off. So you notice a lot of small, expectant faces turning around to you like, is this part of the show? Is, is it the man on stage telling jokes? Is it, is it you? What's going on? And again, it's that small kid thing of you're the adult doing things in this situation. Poke with stick. What are you going do to do? Something. Do something. <laughs> I'm going to lean on my broom, which is much larger than me, so it's much like this, and say, hmm. Younglings, to enjoy the show is why you are here. But remember. And then I'm going to look for the biggest, naughtiest looking kid. And uh, I'm going to cast Druidcraft to make a purr sound come out of his trousers and say, It is okay to laugh at silly things. Very nice. Okay. So are you doing this with the aim that they believe that the kid's done it? Oh, yes. You're, yeah. Okay. In which case, deception check. It's a flat roll. Don't brad me. Oh, it was on that 20 for so long. It's an eight. Okay. Damn so, you, Brad. It's not my fault. Basically, the kids, they, they looked to you thinking maybe this was kind of like an interactive part of the show. They weren't really sure what to make of it. You deliver that final little speech to them. And as the sound goes off, unfortunately, these kids are well versed in a fart joke. I mean, they're the connoisseurs. They feel like they've invented the genre. So to them, it's just something that they feel they've seen before. You get these slightly kind of critical looks of really, really thought you were gonna persuade us on a fart. But luckily they're not riotous enough that they're actually then gonna kind of start disrupting everyone else around. You just feel that unfortunately in this case, you probably haven't won back the show magic for this particular rancorous row of children. However, what you have done is controlled the chaos for the other audience members around them. Before so I leave, I will just mm. say, mm. pride leads to arrogance. Arrogance leads to hate. Hate leads to accounting. <laughs> this is not good. Under the arts. And then I will leave. <laughs> that needs to be a t-shirt right there. <laughs> that does need to be a t-shirt. <laughs> so on that note, you've left the balcony. And the effect of this particular little happening is that, although, as I said, the rest of the audience are now none the wiser, you've wonderfully saved the show for them. The school trips actually just got maybe a little bit too restless for their own good. And now it's that time where they all decide they need a wee. So they're all getting up and you have lost... Yeah, they basically you've lost 12 audience members as a row of little people go outside. Mm. We call it Malteser time, don't we, Christine? It's the song of Malteser time. Yeah, and then you get Princess all the rappers. comes out, sings a ballad, everyone opens their Maltesers. <laughs> so, as we rejoin the action backstage, obviously Barnabas Smog this whole time has been doing this little emergency comedy number for you all, um, but Smog seems to believe he is starting to get things back on track. Which is why as we rejoin that backstage action, you're going to hear the stage manager's call, uh, which is, Mr. Brian, this is your call. Mr. Brian, your call. Thank you. Uh, that, that's my call. Um, uh, listen, uh, give this to the caretaker. And he chucks his book to the nearest person to, to grab. And he's talking to them as he says it. Yeah, don't worry, mate. The, the crowd will love your energy. You've got so yeah. much energy. Thanks, mate. Comes... Well, you have enough energy for the both of us. Um, I'll see you down here later. Helena, and it, and she just doesn't move. It just hits her chest and falls to the ground. <laughs> just stands her. Nice catch. Um, <laughs> don't sign uh, your souls away uh, anymore before I come Sorry, back. Sorry, darling. Don't um, don't let them fuck you up. Sorry, it's only the second time I've had to do it. And Brian strolls cock of a walk casual cock of the walk to his to his mark 
Okay, we're going to stay on the backstage action for a little bit longer. Now, the caretaker, of course, you will now be able to come and rejoin everybody at this point as you have made your way down from the balcony. So, we've had pens on paper for your signatures. You own the theatre now. And Shackreth starts to wander towards the door of the office. So, let me get this right. Which cycle of hell are you part of? Like, you know, are we talking like one? Or are we talking five? Or are we talking six? Oh, well, here's the most exciting part, darling. They've been restructuring the nine hells recently, taking lots of tips from all your lovely corporations around the multiverse. And I'm now a travelling salesperson. I particularly specialise in going round the creative industries, I do find a lot of corruptible souls there. Oh, yeah. Positive disruption I, I and corruption. I imagine they'll offer them a lot of exposure, right? Oh, unpaid internships are my speciality. Not gonna lie, I didn't think Brad would be the person out of all of us to make a paid in exposure joke, if I'm being, if I'm being totally <laughs> honest. Maybe it's just too raw for the rest of us. <laughs> Uh, um, so how long we got until uh, you know our souls ours for a bit or so you now or what happens so the wonderful thing is darling as long as you remain in your mortal form you can keep beetling about doing whatever you like but when you die oh you'll be coming down with us and believe you me there is quite a bustling theatre scene in the hells now so we'll keep you nice and busy Right, so my next step then is to find immortality. Thank you. That's good to know. <laughs> now then, my darlings, I do need to complete your handover, as it were. So, would you all like to come and see the little corporate package that I was arranging for Smog before we sorted this little contract? Um, so, just to be sure, before we see this contract, mm. this, this, this arrangement that you had with him, is now that we've well, got this does this affect your arrangement with him do you have to deliver or can, do we now take ownership or whatever it is oh well you can absolutely take ownership of it darling but do remember that smog had already put certain things into action what you do with them now of course is entirely up to you and after all Smog doesn't actually know at this point in time that this little transaction's taken place so from here on out, the decision is all yours. Okay, well, what I'd like to do is see this, because, you know, we don't sign for anything, any delivery, until you've seen it. Then we'll uh, we'll look it over, check it's working, um, and if we're unhappy, we'll uh, we'll have a chat. All right, so don't go far. I'm not signing up, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I know we've signed that, but I'm not signing off on that until we've checked it, because that's what you do. All right? Well... Your signature is already on the paper, I'm afraid, my dear. But I'll still take you yeah, to inspect we've the signed goods. On a, let's just have a little look, because uh, if this package is part of that contract, then you have to deliver it properly, right? And we have to be satisfied, right? So let's go and have a look. Right. Oh, don't worry. This is going to be a proper handover, darling. Okay. Shin well, sort of rubs uh... his hand together. It's like, oh, corporate package. This sounds better by the minute. I mean, this sounds a lot like Ryan's Monday morning work instead of a Sunday game, but who, who knows? Well, listen. Uh, <laughs> listen, do you first... think that's bad? Think about Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's busman's holiday. <laughs> All right, Shakrath, you first. Go on. Okay, so Shakrath's going to lead you all, if assuming everyone would like to come. Anyone hanging back? Uh, yeah, I'm following. Baruch is. He's, he's going. Okay. Shakra's going to lead you over to the prop store. Um, so as you come into the prop store, it's not immediately apparent what they're talking about because the prop store is very full of stuff. So there's shelves and shelves and shelves all over the place. Um, you notice that basically it seems to be full of, I mean, let's be honest, quite cheap 
items. There's a few magical things littered around, but generally speaking, it's the old magic of theatre thing where things are made of cardboard and paint and fabric and glue. And there's most things that the Smog Theatre's ever put on stashed somewhat haphazardly, kind of wedged into all these different aisles. So your view is a little bit obscured of the whole room because you've got quite high stacks of objects up all around you on this shelving. You do notice immediately, however, there is something that you haven't seen in the prop store before. There is not one, but two identical statues of Barnabas Smog. They're both standing at the end of aisles of shelving. You haven't seen these statues before, and although it seems kind of in character for Smog to commission a statue of himself, commissioning two is a bit weird. So yeah, you've got these two identical statues standing there at the end of the shelves as you enter the room. I mean, how expensive do they look? They're quite cheap. So again, in the same vein as a lot of the stuff that's kind of been littered around here, the statues themselves are not especially grand looking. You think that corners have been slightly cut here, the likeness is a little bit off, but both are exactly the same as each other. So where the nose is a little bit wonky and doesn't quite look like Barnabas, that is matching on both cases. Can I cast Detect Magic on it, please? Okay, so which one are you casting Detect Magic on? You've got two statues to choose from. Um, one of them basically is slightly more to the west, one to the east. They both stand at basically the end of aisles of shelving. Uh, so forgive me, those regular viewers only know I play a lot of strikers and this magic stuff is new to me. Um, is tech magic a singular point? Oh, I'm sorry, that? that's a good point. It's an area, isn't it? Not mm, a singular yeah, one. Yeah, so you're right, it will actually be able to get right. both of them because they are close enough together. You're quite right, that's me getting a rule wrong. Right. So, in which case you can cast detect magic on both. Now just mm. remind me of the text of detect magic for what you would be able to see. Uh, you sense magic in a way you turn the spell. It's like a particular school. You learn what school of magic it is, if any. Okay. While Kelsey's doing that, uh, Helen is going to go up and draw uh, glasses and a moustache on each of the um, statues. I don't know. I think it's making it any worse. The are you good? So, are very nice. I'm just going to hold you there. So you're going to move further into the room. And you're going mm -hmm. to approach and touch a statue. I'm going to draw on it with my makeup. Yeah, I imagine, I guess it was where the Kelsey's Detect Magic goes off before I make it there, I guess. Okay. Dep are you going to do this while Kelsey I mean, is casting? I cast it as a, yeah, I'm, I'm not a spell, wasn't it? Either. So it wasn't a ritual. So it didn't like okay. hang around for 10 minutes. I used cool. the spell So that first. was like instantaneous. Okay, so what we're going to do is we'll resolve that first. And then you can decide if you're going to step forward and apply makeup to a statue. So, the, you know that one of the statues is a statue. You know that the statue to the western side, there is definitely something going on there. Um, give me one moment to check the exact aura that this is going to give off. So, I think uh, you... I think uh, a statue on the right there's got a got a something something a little funky about it. So you know that it's an illusion. The statue to the west is an is there's there's some kind of illusion going on with that statue to the left hand side. The other one, just nothing's nothing's pinging. It seems pretty normal. Um, if that's just happened, Helen, are you still going to go forward? The one that he says is a normal statue, mm -hmm. I'm going to be drawing. Uh, okay, so you're going to approach that one. Um, As he and... says this, can mm -hmm. the caretaker cast detect thoughts? Okay, so can I just check at this point? How many people have moved into the room to start doing this stuff? I know obviously calcifiers just cast yeah. that. Presumably, was that as you were coming in? No, I sort of. I, or... So if, we, if we've walked in and we've seen the statues, I feel like calcifiers mm -hmm. walked in to to inspect them, 
you know, Helen have a little look. In. Yeah. I'm, st I'm still stood at the doorway. Yeah, Stuart stood at the doorway. I am in between their legs, as I am only three feet tall. Well, I'm I'm only four feet tall, so that's not going to work. Okay. Excuse me, Shaggy. There seems to be something wrong with one of these statues. <laughs> So what I am going to say is at this point, because we've got people now moving in, so this was just before you let your detect thought spell off, just in case it changes your decision. If you're going to move in, you are going to see at this point that behind where the statues are, on the back wall of the prop store, so this is directly to the north, mm. there is a portal on that wall. The portal is filled with some kind of rippling black opaque substance so you can't see through it but it appears to be a perfect circle of this strange black rippling effect and around the edge of the circle on that wall are three gems they're glowing and purple and they've been arranged so that they're exactly equidistant from each other around the circle so they seem sort of form part of its edge so you've got this rippling circular portal three gems and that's on the back wall of the prop store and you can see it it's actually behind kind of where some of the aisles of shelving are so you've not seen the whole thing yet but you can see that's basically what's going on at the back of the room uh so means someone's torn this theater a new one detect, on. detect magic is 10 minutes so as i move within 30 feet of it can i detect what magic it all is, is being given i'll yeah. step up behind kelsey holy patoli i didn't see none of that before Cool. So Calcify is moving up to try and detect magic on the portal. And can I check, is the caretaker still wanting to detect thought on the statues at this point as you see that portal? Mm, yes, he is. Absolutely. Okay. Well, so detect thought is cast on me and I can detect the thought of any creature. Perfect. So in which case you are going to detect the thoughts of the suspicious statue. The statue is currently thinking, mm, they look tasty. I really hope they come a bit closer. Mm. I was looking to see if I would have to clean up the portal, mm, but I guess we can work with this. Um, I would not advise touching this statue. It wants to feed. Okay. Uh -oh. And for your results of you moving forward, I'm just double checking on our map here that I can get you within 30 feet, obviously without you coming into contact. Uh, you... So in order to do it, you would be able to take a route around if you wanted to, um, but you would probably need to move, you sort of need to, to dodge it but you could if you wanted to. I probably will wait then. Um, obviously, now that the I've detected door, I detected magic. Mm -hmm. I've seen this. I've relayed it, and then thing is to cast detect thoughts, and told us uh, the caretaker's detect thoughts. What you say? This one over here wants to eat us, but it's just the statue. <clears throat> no, the other one. The one you said. Oh, you not the stat. Not okay. The one on the well. Oh, okay, I got you. Now it's the other one. Okay. Um, Dolores, have we dealt with um the, the eating statues before? Dolores, where are you, Dolores? <laughs> okay. So, you've got a portal. You've got a statue that wants to eat you. <laughs> Elsie, go deal with the portal, and Helena walks in a six-inch platforms straight up to the other statue and kicks it straight in the stomach so this is the thinking statue that you're kicking in the stomach yeah, with a miss piggy Hiya! <laughs> okay <laughs> so anyone else got anything they want to be doing at the moment where helena is going to kick a statue in yes. the stomach i see disturbance and i close my eyes and cast bless and is that okay? So, uh, how many people can bless effect? Well, depending on the level I cast it at, um, I'm going to cast it at first level only, and I am going to bless uh, 
Calcify, Helena, and Varug. Okay. You've done bless. Helena's kicking a statue. Before this goes any further, is there anything else that people were doing in this room? I think. I would be I'd be ready to walk forwards, obviously knowing Helena, but like I'm not prepping anything, casting anything. I'm just trying to figure out what it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna draw my sword and just have it next to me, ready. Um, But yeah, other than that, I'm just keeping an eye. And on that note, we are going to leave it here for this episode of the show. Must go on. So (laughs) join us next time to find out what happens. And remember, you can stay up to date with the cast of Blood and Song through our social media. Ryan, what are the handles? You can find us on Twitter at Blood Song Party or on Facebook and Instagram at Blood and Song. You can find us on YouTube if you search Blood and Song Aaronwell to beat that sneaky algorithm. You can listen to episodes cut up into nice bite-sized chunks wherever you get good podcasts. And also we have a Reddit community now forward slash R uh, Blood and Song. Okay. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Take care, everybody. And we will see you back in the Smog Theatre soon.